Um, again, my name is Karen Worth, and I will be doing um, just some introductory and, and closing remarks and slides. Um, we also have um, Ken Green. He is with our accounting and finance branch. He's going to be talking to you all about um, the vendor, uh, vendor. Uh, piece of it. We also have Thelma Hawkins, who's with our grants Yo, management branch. Um, she is going to be talking about awards, award notifications, and important links that are going to be coming to you down the pipe. Uh, thirdly, joining us will be Alan Coldiron. He is our procurement branch manager, and he will be talking to you about um, how to procure services, how to, how to send information to KDE to procure services for you, as well as reimbursements. Um, and then lastly, we have Larry Mays, who's with our resource management group, and he's going to talk a little bit uh, with you all today about inventory. So um, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to uh, get the PowerPoint rolling for you and we'll jump right in. If you do have questions, um, please feel free to put those, keep, keep everyone muted and put your questions in the chat box. We do have um, Nicole Vanover, um, also with the Division of Budgets and Financial Management. She's going to be monitoring those chats for us. So if you could put your questions in the chat and keep your microphones muted and your speakers off, we would very, very appreciate that. All right. Okay. So we still have some people coming in. We, we are after nine, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So. Hmm. So we're here today, of course, to talk about the EANS money, it's what we refer to it as KDE, um, the Emergency Assistance for Non-Public Schools. Um, as you know, we've talked about this previously in other webinars. Um, there is an application process. And what we're going to talk about today is just dive a little bit deeper into the other pieces, the reimbursement piece, the inventory piece, uh, procurement, um, and the vendor setup and that type of thing. So the fun with me too, right? And if you please don't mind to mute your microphones. So as you all are aware, uh, the EANS money um, was part of the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund or the GEAR funding. And it provides reimbursement um, or services to eligible non-public schools that have been impacted by COVID-19. Um, there's approximately $40 million available that did come to KDE as the state education agency. Um, whereas in the past, um, non-public schools may have received funding through their local um, school public school district or LEA. Uh, these dollars are different. They came to, the, um, to KDE to be administered, and we are working through the uh, processes that we need to do to make sure that um, we are able to get these services and, and reimbursements out to you all in a timely and efficient manner. Uh, we are not in the business of um, doing this for non-public schools, so it's been a learning process um, as we move along. So I appreciate always your patience as we, as we continue to navigate through this. Um, we do not supply funds directly to the applicants. Um, as I said, it would be at a reimbursement or a procurement of services. And that the um, per pupil amount is set for $400 per student, and there is an additional $250 for each low income student enrolled. Some of the special considerations, we'll reiterate these again for our applicants. Um, you must make sure that the um, assistance that you're requesting is reasonable, necessary, and allocable. Um, just wanted to, to keep that in and remind you all that those are three important pieces when completing your application. For today's webinar, we're going to talk about um, a few topics that are really um, specific to the um, the processes that we do here in the Division of Budgets and Financial Management and in resource management with management within our Office of Finance and Operations. So we're going to talk about the, the vendor EZ form and the W-9. I know that a lot of you have um, or some of you have been sending questions to the email um, we've we've provided with some needing some clarity on those. So we have Ken Green that's going to talk on that, um, how to access your funds once you are awarded to make a purchase. Um, what to submit for reimbursement for past and future purchases, 
what is needed for KDE to make purchases for the non-public school, and then lastly, our inventory piece. I will turn it over to Ken Green now, and he will talk about the Vendor Easy Forum um, and answer, um, it, like I said, any questions that you have, please make sure you put those in the chat and we'll address them. Ken? Thank you, Karen. Uh, so I'm going to discuss the Easy Form in W9. So when you submit your request to KDE, please know that you have to send both of those forms with your application. Uh, before you submit the application, if you choose to submit your Easy Form in W9 to create a vendor code first, you may do so. The K number is a uh, accounting code that's required for us to for you to apply for the EANS funding when submitting your information for purchase or reimbursement by KDE. Um, some of you out there may have an existing vendor code already. We're going to get into that in just a minute. Um, if you know for fact that you do have an existing vendor code, it could be KS followed by eight digits or KY followed by eight digits. If you do have that, um, then we're going to want to know what that number is when you submit your easy form. There is a field for that. That way we can identify that there is an existing bank account and that we will create a separate KY number for these funds because we don't want to commingle these funds with something else. Um, there's other agencies you may be working with or uh, there may be other accounts that you're using. So just to make sure that we keep this clean, we're going to separate those accounts. If you do know you have an account for the school lunch program, please contact Cheryl Wiley. We provided her email uh, address up here prior to submitting your form. This is just one step for us just to make sure that we do not accidentally create a vendor code and overwrite that existing account. Um, what would happen is when you requested funds, these funds would end up going into the, the incorrect account. We don't want that to occur. So we're doing everything we can to try and prevent that. So we just appreciate if you do know you have that uh, account already set up to contact her. And if you have any questions at all, um, down here at the bottom, and we'll get to this bullet point, we have the KDE Financial Management Vendor <coughs> email inbox, you can submit any of those questions uh, to that inbox and we will uh, get those answers to you back as soon as we can. One of the most uh, frequently asked questions is multiple non-public schools in our network share a tax ID. How do we complete the easy form, <clears throat> the easy vendor form? Each non-public school in the network must complete the easy form with the network's tax ID the remaining information should be specific to the school. The application, the applicant should upload the W-9 for their network. An example of that would be if <clears throat> you use the EIN, say for the diocese in your uh, local district, but the funds are going to be gone, going to the school and not to the diocese. What you'll want to do on the easy form is enter the diocese EIN number but then the information underneath should be specific to the school. That way, when we go in to create the account, we can make sure that the information will be specific to the school using the diocese uh, EIN number. If you have any questions on that, please feel free to, to email us or contact us, and we'll uh, be happy to address that for you. What is the procedure for submitting the easy vendor and W-9 forms early? The easy vendor and W-9 forms can both be completed early and submitted to the email right here. Um, this is the email inbox and it is monitored by multiple staff in the accounting and finance branch. So if you have questions, if you submit that information, you can expect to get an answer uh, within a day or two at least. Uh, we try to get a quick turnaround on that. And if we have any questions for you, we will be contacting you as well. This is an optional step that will expedite the grant processing. The easy vendor and W-9 forms are required to be uploaded with your application regardless of whether or not you submit, submit them to KDE early. Essentially, if you know you want to apply for these funds, before you have your application complete, you can go ahead and request your 
vendor code and we can get that set up and ready for you and sent back to you as you're putting together your application or you can get your application ready and then request the vendor code that's optional it's totally up to you karen can you go to the next slide can we submit the easy vendor and w9 forms as linked to shared drives such as google drive or onedrive no files must be submitted as attachments when emailed to the department or uploaded to the application this just has to do with we don't have access to your shared drive so if you do email that um, what will happen is we'll just email you back and request that this information be sent on an attachment pdf something like that if our non-public school already has a vendor number are we required to apply for a new one in the event the non-public school has a valid K number designated for cafeteria funds or anything else, non-public schools may be required to apply for a new vendor number. However, non-public schools must submit a completed easy form with their application. Non-public schools may submit their previously approved easy vendor form. This kind of touches on what I spoke earlier. If you have it, an existing account already a vendor number and you want to apply for these funds, we're going to need for you to submit that information to us. So that way we can just verify that we can set up a separate account for you. So you will have a vendor code for your, it could be your cafeteria funds and you're gonna have a vendor code for the EANS funds. As well, make sure that that's very important for everyone to understand because we're gonna, we're gonna separate that. And when I email you your K number, I will identify that K number as the one to be used for EANS, just so we know that we don't uh, mix anything up. Should non-public schools submit W-9 forms for vendors that they intend to pay from the EANS program? No, non-public schools are only required to submit their own W-9 to KDE along with the completed easy form. Other than that, I see that we've had some questions coming. Karen, do you want me to address those now or do you want to wait till the end? I would go ahead, Ken, if you can, if you want to go ahead and address them now. Nicole, can you read the first one that the screen's disappeared? I don't want to. OK, the first question is, how can we find our K number? OK, if. <clears throat> if you don't know what your K number is, you can email our inbox that was on the prior slide. Could you, could you go back to that, Karen? So. Towards the bottom in, in purple, we have the KDE FIN management vendor regular reg at education.ky.gov inbox. You can you can submit that question there and we can look it up for you. Um, we can verify if you have one already or if you do not have one. OK, and we had one more question. It's in the application. Where do we enter the K number? I don't know that I, I don't actually have the application. So, um, so the the K number will not be entered in on the application. Um, you won't need to do that because that that you won't. Some of you won't have that prior to submitting your application. So there's no place on there to submit that. And I believe that's all surrounding this process. All right, well, um, I guess I'll hand it back over to Karen. Again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email that uh, our inbox and uh, we'll do everything we can to get that done quickly. And we're just here ready to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Selma Hawkins will be talking a little bit about the awards and some important links that will be forthcoming. Selma? Okay. Um, so one of the popular questions on the previous um, webinar webinars was how do we get our funds? Well, once the awards, the applications have been reviewed, um, awards will be made 30 days at the end of that um, time period, which so we're looking towards the end of April. We will create in the Division of Budgets and Financial Management, we will create award notifications. This is the same process that we use for our public schools. The award notification will be a PDF file with 
um, all of the schools. So you will have to f go into that document and find your school name. That document will um, include information such as your school name, your school address, the amount you were awarded, the period of award, um, KDE contacts. Um, also, it will have the um, dates for the time that you will um, need to submit your last reimbursement request. It would have all grant related, fiscal grant related information um, for your particular award and for the EANS grant. Also, um, we will contain, it will contain links on um, how to submit your reimbursement requests, um, how to procure information, how to procure um, links about how to procure um, services, which Alan will talk about a little later, but any information related to the grant um, reimbursement process uh, will be contained in that document. So once all of the documents um, have been created, they will be posted on the EANS website. Since you are familiar with that website, that will be your source of all information related to EANS, whether it's fiscal or programmatic. Oh, I'm sorry. My then um, after the um, awards are posted, um, the Ombudsman will send an email to all of the awardees. So whoever will be listed as your contact, whoever you list as your contact um, on your application, that is who will receive the email regarding the notification of awards have been posted to the website. So please keep that in mind. Um, next slide, Karen. So for reimbursement, we're, we are still working on this process, but we are thinking that um, we, were gonna, we will have a one pager um, with information um, that you would need to provide to us. Um, for instance, your K number will need to be on that document, your school information, your contact name, we'll need the contact name and number. So if there are any questions, we'll need to follow up. Um, with you, the items purchase, uh, it'll be maybe information about um, whether it's going to be a reimbursement or procurement process, the amount you're reimbursed, you need to be reimbursed, and um, and maybe the, whatever additional documentation. As I stated, we're, this is still a work in process, but this is what it will look like. Um, you'll have a cover page and then you have to submit what once we decide what supporting documentation is needed, uh, you will need to provide that documentation along with that reimbursement template. Okay. Next slide. Oh, okay. So this is um, some of the things we think you will probably um, have to submit for your re with your reimbursement um, request, the receipt of purchase, um, maybe a copy of the canceled checks or a copy of the credit card statement, but we will want you to any personal identifying information if it's a credit card statement uh, or we would want you to um, block out any personal identifying information, but all of that will be in the instructions. Um, like I said, this is just, we're still hashing this out, but this will give you an idea of what, what the process is going to look like, what um, information we may be requesting. We're going to do our best to try to make this as seamless um, and easy and possible for you. And as Karen stated, this is a learning process for all of us. So um, we will, uh, we're doing our best to try to um, make it easy on both sides and just be here to serve you in any capacity uh, that's needed. Um, next slide. Oh, I think this is Alan. Thank you, Selma. Okay. Um, Alan? Thank you, Karen, and uh, thank you, Thelma. You was on a roll there. Uh, Karen, if you go back to the, the previous slide, please. OK, so on this, I just wanted to also kind of reiterate the 
the reimbursement process is going to be the the documentation that you are going to provide to me to, you saying, to process you need your your, your reimbursement is going to be very important. Oh, okay, okay. Because the amount of of items that you purchase, say you purchase ten computers and you're requesting reimbursement for that. I'm going to need to know that quantity that you purchased because when I process your re reimbursement, that is going to create a process internally for us to inventory those items. Uh, and the our inventory folks folks will go into that more, but it's really really important that I know that information up front because I actually start that process for them in the the payment uh, and your reimbursement request. So having that detailed information. If you bought a quantity of something, I'll need to know the quantity that you bought, the unit price of what you bought as well. OK, uh, Karen, next slide, please. OK, so to procure the items. Basically, the the spending authority and our purchasing process that we do at the state level is now going to filter down to your level if we are going to be doing the procurement for you. So the some of the important things that I'm going to want to know, uh, kind of like uh, to go off what Thelma said, your reimbursement request is going to be kind of a one pager. Your request for procurement is also going to be kind of a one pager. And some of the things that I'm going to want to know is the timing of your processes, what your overall vision of what you want to accomplish is. I'm want, if you're requesting some type of a service with your funds, I want to want to know what those service dates are that you're requesting. I'm going to need to know what category that purchase request falls under. OK, commodity question mark, construction question mark, service question mark. The reason I put that on there is because if it's a commodity. Our our process is different. I'm going to try to utilize the services and the commodities that we have on master agreement as much as possible to speed up the process for you. But if you're requesting something that is not on contract, whether it's commodity or service, then that process can be slow because I may have to bid something out. Construction, also a different part of our process, a different spending authority that we have. We have to go through a different uh, oversight agency uh, within the finance cabinet that handles uh, construction purchases called DECA. So our spending authorities, whether it's a commodity, a construction or a service based item is all different. So those are going to be something that uh, things that I need to know what you're requesting. I'm also going to need to know a description of the item. If it's a commodity based, do you have part numbers? Include any part numbers that you're that you know of in your request. I'm also going to need to know how many a quantity that you're requesting. If you have done uh, went out and got quotes. I will need to have those as well because that could help me try to find something that. I've already on master agreement or let me know up front. No, we're not going to have anything even close to that. This is going to be something I'm, I'm possibly going to have to bid. OK, and then lastly, I would need to know your requested delivery date. Now, this is just requested. Delivery dates are not guaranteed. Uh, we cannot speak for uh, availability from vendors. You know, if things are on back order, uh, I'm going to tell you right now during this COVID time, supply chains are struggling, uh, especially if you're going to start requesting uh, cleaning supplies, uh, PPE, uh, you know, anything that that we've had to to request an abundance of because of COVID, uh, your your delayed uh, delivery times are, are going to be delayed because of stocking issues. OK, uh, I believe that covers uh, my section as far as your procurement requests. Uh, and again, I'll I kind of reiterate what Ken said. I'm ready to serve in any way, shape or form that I can. Thank you, Alan. Um, next topic will be inventory and Larry Mays is going to talk to us about that. Larry. 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to touch on this kind of quick and let you know before we get started, you know, there's going to be some things in this process that's probably going to change, but we're just going to kind of do a brief overview of some of the things, you know, we're going to need. Um, any, we're going to be inventorying any items purchased at some price point. I don't think that price point is 100% been set yet. So, um, we're going to be inventorying non-consumable materials and equipment, and they will remain the property of KDE. Uh, KDE must assume title to non-consumable materials and equipment for which non-public school receives reimbursement. Additional information around inventory is going to be forthcoming on this because, like I said, we're still making changes right now, um, trying to you know tune in our process a little bit. But any items that are purchased from the by the non-public schools, um, and you know, KD will have title of, and we will be inventorying um, all of those items at some price point, which we'll set forth kind of at a later date. If you could give me the next slide, please, Karen. Um, we are required on a yearly basis to do inventory, which means at you know the end of the fiscal year every year we're going to be contacting you with a report of what we have listed uh, as your items your assets and and whoever that custodian is for that school will be required to send us back the report stating that they do have the items signing off that those items are still there at your location um, you know, an asset is something that is intended for internal use. It's not for resale. It has a useful life extending beyond at least the fiscal year in which it was acquired, which is going to be just about anything, and that has a monetary value. Um, next slide, please, Karen. Uh, the asset custodian, and this is kind of important here, is going to be the person responsible for the assets received and will be assigned a custodian code for identification in the state inventory system. Uh, this is going to be key for me to have uh, someone at your location that I can be in contact with to give your inventory report to, as well as um, someone that's going to be able to provide us with the correct paperwork if there's any changes made. Like if you've had a, you know, say a laptop stolen or something like that, we have uh, paperwork which we will be sending out um, for everyone um, you know we just need to make sure we have an updated list at all times of the person we need to contact for these items um, this person like i said will conduct the an annual physical inventory and observation um, the report will be provided by kde i will send that to you directly at the time at that time um, there's a certain time frame that's outlined for this um, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, you know, any changes I said that'll be made to your inventory at any time uh, needs to be documented. Um, I'll send those those uh, those documents out. I just have there's a few pages uh, just to make changes in your inventory. So if you have a item that was damaged, if you have an item that was stolen or an item that no longer works and it needs to be disposed of, uh, there'll be paperwork that needs to be filled out for those items to ensure that our inventory is kept as accurate as possible. Um, you know, these are also uh, files that you will need to maintain. Um, and like I said, the report, I will be sending that to you. So that's not something you have to be concerned with, but any changes that are made at any time to your inventory, uh, you know, this, this documents will need to be kept on site. And, you know, basically what we want to do here is make this process as easy as possible. It should be fairly simple as long as, you know, um, everybody uh, adheres to the, you know, the guidelines we have here. And like I said, there will be a couple of things that will change here, but I think for the most part, that's going to cover um, about anything uh, for the inventory. Thanks, Larry. Karen, we do have a couple questions regarding inventory. Do you want to go ahead and address those? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, someone is is wanting to know the dollar threshold. Uh, we I don't think we've completely set that yet. Uh, we've talked about it amongst ourselves a few times. That's going to be something we're going to provide at a later date. We're not sure uh, 100% on that dollar threshold just yet. 
OK, and then another one is asking, do we need to inventory reimbursements? Yes, if you've purchased something that you are going to ask um, to be reimbursed for out of your EANS award, then yes, it would need to be inventoried as well. OK. I believe that's all we have so far regarding inventory. Great, thank you. So that concludes those topics that we wanted to talk specifically about. I um, just want to reiterate with you all the responsibilities of KDE in this process. Um, I think the first one is so important is to communicate with and provide assistance to the applicants. Um, as you've heard several times today and in our previous webinar, um, you know, um, I'll use a phrase that, that I've heard a lot the last year. We're you know, we're, we're, we are building the plane as we're flying it. So um, you will continue to get correspondence from us. Um, you will continue to get links to um, guidance, um, email addresses, um, inboxes that you can send questions to. So we will continue to um, supply you with information as we obtain it. And, and sometimes that, that comes to us um, from additional guidance we re receive from USCD. So, um, of course, we always ask your patience in, um, in, in working with us and, and trying to, to figure all of this out. We will probably um, more than likely have another webinar in the another, next uh, couple of weeks to talk about some additional information. Um, so stay tuned for that. And those, those uh, correspondence will go out through the ombudsman's um, uh, inbox as it has in the past. Um, receive and evaluate the applications for quality consistency with allowed expenditures, reasonableness, and connect, connection to program intent, and then to allocate reimbursements and provide for services. Uh, just to reiterate the application submission process for you guys, um, the, the window opens from March 26th, closes March 20, I'm sorry, March 23rd to March 26th. Um, we will not be receiving applications um, beyond the closing date. Uh, official submissions will only be accepted using the provided Survey Monkey link. Once received, applications will be scored and assistance will be awarded um, within 30 days. And then your funds must be obligated for services within six months. So again, all um, familiar information that's been shared previously, but just wanted to keep it in um, so that you guys could, could see it again and, and uh, re-familiarize yourself with those dates. Lastly, we, we're showing um, several links um, that you guys can use. Of course, the EANS guidance, um, as Thelma mentioned, um, that is listed on our EANS website. So any correspondence or communication that you will receive from us will come in various ways um, through emails and whatnot. But but your EANS website um, link is your um, is your first notification process. Anything that's EANS related will be posted there. Um, questions that you have about any of the application process, um, things that we talked about today um, can be sent to that um, KPSO at education.kbot.gov mailbox. Uh, David Malanti, our state ombudsman, he monitors that and sends those uh, questions out to the appropriate folks that are here at the department to address. Um, and also, as Ken um, spoke of earlier, your vendor easy and W9 forms can be sent to that email listing or, or listed there on the slide. But additionally, questions. If you have questions for Ken and his group, um, specifically around the vendor process, please feel free to send questions there um, and they can they can definitely assist you um, as quickly as possible. So that concludes our presentation today. Um, Nicole, do we have questions in the chat? We more do. Questions? OK, great. If you want to start reading those. OK, um, we have some questions that are specific relating to like the numbered questions on the application. Um, one being what is the character limit on the narrative questions such as number 18, 21 and 24? Is to, uh, and I'm going to ask David Malanti was going to try to join us today. He had a conflict. I'm not sure if David is on or not. David, yeah, I'm, okay, I'm here and I do not know right offhand 
what the character limit is, but uh, maybe I can follow up with Matthew on that. I don't think he's on here and, and find out. OK, um, another question was, are we going to choose what we spend our funds on? And I had chimed in that there was a list of allowable activities that, that, that they had to adhere to. But does anyone else have anything to add to that? No, that okay. those are those are outlined in the application. So you are correct, Nicole. OK, um, another question. Is there wanting clarification on what is included in questions number 20 and 21? They ask, is that salaries only or do we need to include supplies there too? David, are you aware or do you just need to look into that? I need to. I'm trying to pull the application up. Hold on okay. just a minute. That's yes, okay. that would be helpful because there, there are other questions in regards to specific numbers on the application. Um, we'll go ahead and skip those and, and just move on while he pulls that application up. At what point do we provide receipts? Alan, are you? Well, I can take it. Thelma, go ahead. It will be when they, you submit your reimbursement request. When you are ready to seek reimbursement, you've received the um, items and whatever forms we provide to you to seek reimbursement at that time, uh, you will complete that template and submit all the supporting documentation for reimbursement. Okay, so the actual reimbursement documentation will take place after the grant has been awarded. On the application, we are just making a request for allocation that will hopefully result in reimbursement. Correct. Okay, give me just a moment. We've got a lot of questions I'm sorting through. So any new purchases must be made through KDE, someone is asking. No, um, a school can decide to to make a purchase and file for reimbursement on future um, purchases as well. We do not have to procure everything moving forward. You can make a purchase in the future and file for reimbursement just as you can file for reimbursement for past um, purchases. Karen, the only caveat to that would be those disallowed categories. Correct. Thank you, David. Yes, and they are outlined in the application as well. Is there a set amount that we are allowed to pay per hour to staff who would be delivering, tutoring, or remediation to students? Karen, I've been guiding folks to make sure they include those items in their budget using their own salary and benefit schedules. That at least gives us a number to work with. Um, so, so make sure that you're including those numbers um, in your budgets. Absolutely. And Nicole, can we stop for a moment? Yeah. Um, Lisa Schultz has her hand up. Lisa, do you want to un unmute? And yes, thank you so much. I couldn't find, we can't find the little chat sy symbol in our, um, how uh, Microsoft is projecting here on our screens, but I had a question related to staffing. I know the FAQs say that you are able to use um, funds for staffing, we had some questions related to, can those be um, individuals that we hire or existing staff members, or does KDE have to do the hiring for those positions and whose employees are they? Because we're not familiar with that. So if you could share just some uh, how that typically works if we want to have individuals perform services for us. Karen, do you want me to start that one? Sure. Um, so, so Lisa, it really depends on what category you're connecting to there. For example, <clears throat> the category for initiating um, and maintaining um, virtual school, I, I forgot what the, the 
exact language is, but that is not allowed to be reimbursed. And those types of expenses would have to uh, be administered by KDE and um, those employees essentially would, would become the employees of KDE at that point, sort of like what you would do with um, Jefferson County or another district where um, typically they would hire the, the staff and those people are actually employees of, of the district. There is a category about um, containing the, the spread of COVID and some people have asked whether they could, you know, provide like contracts with nursing staff. Um, and yes, that, that would be okay. And those types of costs, which um, that particular category is not on the disallowed list, that cost could be reimbursed. So it just depends on, on whether or not it's one of those categories that um, is or is not allowed to be reimbursed. Okay, what about, um, if I may, um, a lot of wanting to provide some additional instructional support, whether it be after school or over the summer, um, would that, like a third party, like a catapult learning or other third party providers may be able to be used? Can uh, individuals, and this would be moving forward, I guess, um, can individuals be used in that capacity to combat learning loss? Um, yeah, they could be, but again, um, it's going to depend on what category you're trying to connect to, and, and one of the learning loss categories, um, again, is not reimbursable, so um, yes, it could be. I think if you have a particular third party that you're interested in using, maybe put that in the application, uh, make a connection to why you want to want to use that particular um, third party. Maybe you've used them in the past or you have an existing relationship with them and then um, we'll, we'll move forward from there. I think though, again, if it's um, in one of those disallowed categories, it may be uh, something we have to contract with that third party to provide those services. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Lisa. Nicole, do you want to start back? Yes. Um, can you review the low income threshold? We have families with multiple children who qualify for need based aid, but wouldn't qualify for free and or reduced lunch limits. I'll uh, Karen, I'll take that one. The um, so we did we, we've had some I've had some conversation with a couple schools about this particular topic, and one of the things we said was that tuition assistance is an allowable indicator for low income. Um, the issue we've run into in a couple cases is that any or all families can apply for and may receive tuition assistance. Um, the, the thing we need to be on the same page here about is when you're using tuition assistance, that should be a reflection of low income families and not all families. So there are cases where in one particular school, um, all families um, or almost all families receive tuition assistance for doing things such as um, service to the school, providing some volunteer hours, for example. Um, in that case, that is not going to be a, a quality indicator because that that is going to include some families, for example, that are not low income. So um, we have posted a resource where if you're running into that situation um, that we, we have posted from the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, um, low income qualification for free and reduced lunch and reduced price lunch for the 1920 school year. And you could use a simple survey or if you can, if you have a system where you can pull numbers for kids that are actually low income. Um, I know some schools do have a system where they can do that. We are in, we are um, going to require you to use those instead of um, saying that all of our families qualify for low and in, in, um, low income status. 
Okay, are we penalized if we ask for more assistance that, than we may be allowed? Well, there's no penalty for that. Um, we cannot guarantee you any additional funding above and beyond what your student um, populations would produce. Um, and and we've kind of said that to everybody who's asked. So, I mean, you could ask for more than you want, but um, I think we're going to probably end up funding initially based on those tentative um, per pupil amounts. I would make a recommendation that as you're filling out, filling out an application that maybe you think about prioritizing the services you want in the whether it's in reimbursement or future services and detailing in the narrative that these services that we're listing here are pri prioritized from one to whatever with one being the highest um, need. Um, that will give us an opportunity to, um, if we can't fund something, move on down the list, or if there's not enough funding to um, work with those top priorities. So I would suggest that as a starting point um, for your budgeting. Okay, are the reimbursement and procurement forms available yet? No, those are not. They're, they're a work in progress. So we are we are currently putting those together and we'll send a correspondence out through um, David's um, uh, email that that will let all of you all know when those are available and posted um, on the EANS webpage, as well as there will be a link supplied on your award notification to where you can access those um, sp specific forms um, as well. If we request a learning loss program such as Lexia and there is a discount for a three year term versus a one year, can we utilize funds for this purchase when the service would go beyond 2023? Thelma, do you want to take that one? I'm sorry, repeat that again, um, Nicole. OK. If we request a learning loss program such as Lexia and there is a discount for a three year term versus a one year, can we utilize funds for this purchase when the service would go beyond 2023? Yes. Yes, because they're purchasing, I guess, like a software license or something. So yes, that would be allowed. Thank you. Do we need to be very specific on the application? Are we just requesting allocation for the possible grant award? For example, if we want to purchase document cameras and more technology materials, do we ask for exactly the amount for each item or can we ask for a general amount allocated to technology expenses? Alan, do you want to jump in on that one? I'm sorry, Nicole. My uh, I got kicked off the call. I had to jump back in. Could you read? Repeat the question for me. Yes. Do we need to be very specific on the application? Are we just requesting allocation for the possible grant award? For example, if we want to purchase document cameras and more technology materials, do we ask for exactly the amount for each item or can we ask for a general amount allocated to technology expenses? Uh, I believe that it would just be a general allocation amount. You wouldn't have to be that specific until you submit your actual uh, procurement request or reimbursement request. I agree with that. OK, and here's another question for you, Alan. If we are planning construction and have already bid the project and awarded a contract, can we continue with that award or do we have to start again? Uh, Karen, uh, correct Let's me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe construction is. Uh, is it that an allowable expense on this? There are some areas of HVAC and, and ventilation and that type of thing. Let us get back to you on that one. OK, OK. Is the EANS only for K through 12? When you are doing your application uh, and putting in enrollment and low income numbers, you should, should only consider um, K to 12 students. However, when funds are awarded, uh, preschool students that are connected to an elementary, for example, could be served 
um, as well, even though their their student counts are not included in the um, count submitted. What category do we put the nurse reimbursement in for the current year and for future years? There's there is a category about. Um, increasing capacity to stop the spread of COVID. I, I don't know the exact language, but it should go in that category. <clears throat> OK, if we are trying to secure a site license for a software program, would we pay for the subscription and then write it in as a reimbursement? Um, I, I believe that would be um, an OK way to do it. Yes. Alan, anything to add? I think they could do either way. They could request it as a reimbursement or they could request it to uh, as a procurement. Yeah, thank you. OK, when the grant amount is verified and communicated, will it be itemized for funds that would that are used to be for reimbursement and those used for future purposes? Selma, help me here. Um, if you want to jump in? I'm going to say no. There won't. They won't be categorized as right. far as how you receive them. Selma, you want to talk more on that? Correct. We will. Whatever the amount is, um, the final amount you will be awarded, it will be that amount. And um, David, correct me if I'm wrong. They can. They can determine how they're going to use that amount, whether it based on what was approved in their application, whether it was for reimbursement or if it was if it is for future items, because and there may be cases something may be deemed unallowable because it was not a reasonable request. So um, is is that your thinking, um, David? Yes. OK. <clears throat> OK, another one surrounding the low income. If we use a service that evaluates families for income and limit tuition assistance to low income families, will that suffice? Yeah, it sounds like that would suffice. Okay. Where is the resource from the USDA for low income families posted specifically? That's posted on the um, EANS web page we've created. Should be in the um, right hand sidebar there is uh i think it's towards the bottom of that sidebar it says resources for determining low income i believe okay if you are restructuring an existing staff member's job duties to embed targeted instruction and interventions into the school day can that percentage of the day linked to the staff member's salary be reimbursed to our payroll department I say yes, David. I, I think so. Well, again, I think it's gonna it's gonna depend on what category, category. it's connected to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, as far as reimbursement goes, again, that initiating um, services for learning loss would be a disallowed category. Okay, if something we ask for is disallowed by KDE, will we be able to request for a different item or service? So David, I'll start, um, you know, through the reviewer process, once the applications are received here, you know, as we have said um, before, you know, we will be communicating back with the non-public schools if we do have questions or need clarity or, um, uh, better definition about about narrative or things that are on the application. David. Yeah, I would agree with that and would say, you know, there. There um, would be some opportunities for communication around those items and then um, in addition to that, that might it might be beneficial again to um, start thinking about prioritizing um, your items um, that you're going to be requesting. How long after we send in our reimbursement can we expect to receive the money? 
you know, at this point, um, you know, we will we will do everything within our um, ability to to get the reimbursements back out to the non-publics as soon as as we as we possibly can. Um, there's really no way for me to say it'll be a 24 hour turnaround at this point because we simply don't know the volume that we're looking at yet. Um, so so that's a I'm not going to be able to give a specific time frame on that answer. Karen, okay. can I speak to that for a second? Sure. So uh, when you submit your easy form, there is an option on there to have direct deposit. And it's totally up to your uh, school if that's the direction you want to go. But I will say that you will receive payment faster through direct deposit than you will through check in the mail. Uh, it has nothing to do with how fast we get the document out. Once we process it, typically within about three business days, that direct deposit should hit your account, whereas the mail will take however long it takes for that check to reach your destination. Thank you, Ken. OK, we've got another one. It's just requesting us to revisit that question about number 20 and 21. Did did someone locate the application so that we could refer to those specific questions? I did. I can't remember the specifics in the question, though. OK, what they're asking for is to clarify what is included in questions 20 and 21. Is that salaries only or do we include supplies there, too? It's anything that you are asking for reimbursement for, so um, you know, whether that is a piece of equipment or just general supplies or, you know, a salary for one of the allowable categories for reimbursement, um, whatever um, you are asking for goes in there. And then 21, you're going to need to make a connection about how those things that you're asking for reimbursement for uh, met the needs of the school. OK, and then another question surrounding question number 22. So it says, how much detail do you need for 22? Just totals, question mark. Karen, and that's the budget. And I think we've told people we, we just want general totals within that particular um, question. And, th and that is just the list of categories and how much is going to be spent there. Correct. So let me stop everybody at this point. We are a couple of minutes until 10 o'clock. Um, and being respectful of everyone's time. Um, our next steps will be, we will post this recording of this webinar to the EANS webpage. Um, we will also gather all of the questions from the chat um, that either were already answered or, or have been left um, without an answer at this point um, and follow up with an FAQ um, that we will send out um, to you guys and to post on that EANS webpage. So, um, I really appreciate everyone being on today. Um, I know as we continue to migrate through this process, we continue to have more specific questions. Um, can't reiterate enough using those mail mailboxes that we've supplied um, to submit those questions. Um, that is going to be the, the best way to get um, attention to a, a particular need in your school. Um, remember, if it's an application, um, question, category question, um, budget question, send to that ombudsman mailbox. If it's a specific uh, vendor question, how do I set this up? What information do you need? Please send that to the vendor email that Ken talked about um, earlier in our presentation. So that being said, um, we'll close for today. Again, appreciate so much everyone joining on and all of the good conversation and questions that we've had. And we will be following up with the FAQ um, here in the next few days. Thank you all and have a good day.